Hi, welcome to the National Career Choice Online News saying hi, I'm Robin Steinberg, welcome to my show again. Today we have a very important guest from Pakistan. He is actually uh, Mr. Salim who is from the uh, Nexo Technologies Limited and he's the CEO and Chairman. And today we're going to find out more about his passion and updates uh, in technologies happening in Pakistan. Uh, Mr. Salim, th thank you for joining me here at the National Career Choice. And uh, you know, I know that uh, you made uh, a lot of commitment and investment in in uh, Nexo Technologies. You know, uh, what kind of plans do you see uh, ahead? Look, it, I think it's all about the timing. Uh, I feel very, you know, lucky that we have matured the company at the right time. It's 16 years in making. In the last 16 years, we have seen lots of ups and downs, like any other business. Especially in the IT industry, we, everybody has gone through different phases. But in its own, we had different challenges. But today, when I look now to the future, we believe we are looking at very exciting times. Reason is simple. We have completed uh, our product line, which is now ready and it's in demand. Product is mature and it's well tested by the customers already we have got. We have got very you know, mature quality standards now. Uh, over a thousand people trained. Uh, with, now with, we have people with experience for the product we are selling. Uh, our quality standards are you know, like uh, at par with the world. Our customers, we have the best clientele one can have. Now when we put all these things together, the future has to be very exciting. And uh, because our product is a financial application, it requires a longer period of testing by the customer before they can give you a stamp of approval. Yes, this product is reliable. Now our application is a number cruncher. It does interest calculation and all those. Those took time for customers to get a confidence. And it's not just with our application. Any financial application goes through that testing phase. We are fine with that now. Now, you say that there are changes that are coming up in the financial sector. Now, uh, what kind of uh, new solutions are you providing to the financial s sector today? Look, our focus mainly is on lending mm -hmm. area. Uh, in lending also, we have mastered and uh, become expert, got expertise in lease and finance industry altogether. Interestingly, there were a lot of uh, different software available for banking sector. If you're a bank, you have a lot of choices to go and buy a software for multiple countries and you know vendors. But lease and finance, uh, not many choices available. Most of the companies in the past were using in-house development, big names had an in-house shop to develop the leasing and financing solution. And few companies outside were offering that solution. When we came in 16 years ago, we saw that opportunity and the niche because we saw customers having in-house development and they have problems. So we started offering a software developed by us and gradually it picked up steam. Now, today, when I look all around the world, I believe that in North America and Europe, companies are still using 30 year old software which runs their portfolio and business. Now that is going to end soon. The technology doesn't exist, people with those skills don't exist, so gradually they will have no choice but to replace the old software. And when they start that, we are in a very good position to get a quite high percentage of the business. Now, speaking about uh, the, you know, the, the opportunities that's laid out on, on hand, um, how long does it take you so far to test these products? The, the development of the product was started in 1997 in small pieces and we started you know, uh, implementing them into the customers uh, businesses. So gradually each module was tested and matured and by 2007 we felt that our application is now mature. Uh, we have enough domain expertise to now claim to the customers, look, we can help you with processes even. It's not just giving them software, but it's helping them with re-engineering the processes also, how they lend money. And that is the key with the vendor. And that came over the period. After 2007, once we realized that we've got all the domain expertise and now we have the complete software, we started looking into a bigger customer base and then, of course, started developing a new generation of the same software. Today we have a new generation software which is an internet based solution completely, a service oriented model as you call it SaaS model. Uh, we believe we can put it on the cloud and customers will have a service 
based system available in next few years. That is the key to our service offering in next five years. And this is where I believe that we will have edge on our other competitors. Now, speaking about the, an edge over your competitors, how different are, you know, are your services that there's going to be different from the others? I, I believe this is a very important question. Look, first of all, because we are based uh, in, in Pakistan, in Lahore, we have a facility which offers a very economical solution, first of all. It, it's key. And we can have many more people to service a customer compared to our competitors who are based in Europe or based in North America. This is where we compete. So our service level is definitely much higher. We can throw more bodies at a customer's problem and make sure they get a, a delivery sooner than other companies can do. So in most cases, our customers are short on time. Uh, they want a new product, a new way of leasing or lending, and they want to change the system. Our company will take months and months before they can make a change. Where we can do it literally overnight, I mean weeks, whatever, shorter period we can, we do that. And this is what has given the edge on our computer. We have been getting ground. Now in China, if you see, we have got 90% of the multinationals using the, running the business on our software. Why is that? Because we have no service level which others cannot afford. Because China is not an easy market. It's a very complex market. And we have really mastered Chinese way of doing business and the service we do is it's at power done. Now, so speaking about the, the markets it overseas, you, know, you managed to penetrate them. How do you how did you manage to study their culture and, and then get the, the culture of Pakistan, the working culture of Pakistan, assimilate with all the other countries? I believe the success always comes when you become local. It doesn't matter where you go. If you stay as an you know, alien or you stay as somebody from overseas, nobody will entertain you or nobody will buy from you. Wherever we go, we have to become local. We have to bring in local teams, local people, and in fact learn from them. Not teach them our culture, but learn their culture. And this is what we have done very successfully. China is a prime example of our success. It's simply, we don't go as a Pakistani company or a American company at all. We went there as a Chinese company. First thing we did was look for Chinese people who had the understanding of their business, bring them in, and with them, we were able to build a remarkable you know, footprint in that country. Same was in Thailand. We are in Japan now. Again, in Japan, we are really going strong. I believe in the next five years, Japan will be a very strong market for us because in Japan, they also have a legacy system of managing. Big companies, lending money, billions of dollars, running the software on a very old software. I think that's where the interesting time for us will be. But again, Japanese is a very complex culture. It's not easy to penetrate. So what you do, you go local. You bring a local part. Hand over to them, train them, let them take your product to the local market. But it's not a franchise, right? It's not a franchise. No, we're not giving franchises at all. We are creating distribution rights where we train their people, they are the front end people, and our people help them implement. Mm. Still, it's a very complex product, so they need our help. But we stay at the background. We st we, our people go in, uh, you know, as solving a problem, but the communication between customer and the vendor is done by the locals. And that way, uh, Japanese feel that they're getting the services from a local company, not from an overseas company. Now, speaking of uh, even the ability to penetrate into these markets, I'm sure that you have some failures that you face uh, along the way. Uh, would you be able to identify those failures? Oh, definitely. Look, no success will come until you pay a price of failures. Definitely, in early days, we did not understand. Uh, when we went to China in 2004, we were excited. Oh, we're going to a big market. And within a year, we realized, oh, oh, this is not going to work out. A uh, few customers in the early days were at least surprised with our, you know, how we're working. So we have to be quickly change our strategy and go local and talk. Same goes with other markets in Asia. We have been very strong in Asia for the last 10 years. And each country in Asia has a specialty in how they do things. Their culture, their way of doing it, their way of lending money, uh, the, the, the way taxation is in that country, the way, you know, different uh, issues which pertain to that country only. Those were learning lessons for us. Not been easy task at all. Early years were very difficult. Uh, we need to, you know, we, we, we need to, we were a young company, small company, and there were times we were not succeeding in business. We didn't get some businesses. Uh, early days and we lost and we realized and you know we were those very depressing days when you lose uh, you thought you get it and the last month well, uh, announced oh they gave it to somebody else those were very difficult days and those were the failures i believe but they were good failures because they did not you know put us back 
we kept going back. We kept understanding, okay, what went wrong? Why this customer? There's one customer bank in Australia. For that, we worked for over a year to get their business. I'm talking about uh, 2001. And we thought we got them. And the last few days, certainly we got the news, oh, they're giving to somebody else in Australia. That was a big failure. And for, for, for a, a day or two, we just sat in silence in the office. What happened? Because we thought that would be the key to our success. That will make us big. It was a big customer, a big value coming in. It didn't happen. But you know, next day, we got to the office and just you know, we said, okay, let's get back to work. Let's get new customers. And we did that. So even though you failed, you know, you, you prefer to just move, just drop it all and move forward and forgive. Is that, is that correct? Look, failures, I always lecture in schools when I'm invited. Without failures, you will not be able to succeed to the extent you want to succeed. You may have mediocre successes in your life, but it's the failures which makes you a better person. You, your judgment gets better, you make better decisions. Uh, until you make wrong decisions, you will not make the right decisions. So my philosophy is simple, with my people also. We have a big team of people. Encourage them, train them, and let them take decisions. But do tell them, look, you take a decision, if it turns out to be wrong, we'll support you. But what we're not supposed is laziness or, or negligence or carelessness. That is not acceptable. But a mistake taken with prior, you know, complete uh, honesty and, you know, there was every, all the work was done when we took the decision and still it failed, let's accept the loss. Let's take it. Just forget it, move on. Don't look back because you can't look back. You can look back to learn, but not look back to sulk and sit down, you know, in depression of what we've done. That doesn't work. Now, let's move forward from here. And that is, uh, you know, family life and, and working and work life. You know, how do you balance that? You know, you're, you you have, you you hold these few positions and different hats. You know, and and I just wonder, you know, how does your family feel about it? Uh, that, uh, you, you, it does take out a lot of, of your time. Look, I believe we all pay a price. There is a price, and. The biggest price uh, I have paid is my daughters grew, their birthdays and their events, their schools events, I was not there. I traveled a lot. Even this travel, this visit to Singapore is on the 8th day. I have to leave my family on the 8th day and take a flight and come to Singapore. But uh, my family is amazing. They really backed me up all the way. There were bad days. There were days where we had really difficulty in managing business, but my wife was always there. Never said, leave it, drop it, or do something else. Always said, no, keep trying. I believe that is very important, to have the support of your spouse, your partner, and your family. Without proper support or full support, you will somewhere get into trouble because obviously they will get upset and they will get frustrated with you. But in my case, I'm very fortunate. Yes, uh, they do uh, get frustrated of my travel a lot, but then they do understand, appreciate, and look, whatever travel I take or wherever I go brings down, you know, more opportunity for the organization. You know, at my level of chairmanship where I am, I believe that company requires, uh, still needs me to meet people. I'd like to be here today. Now, what life lessons uh, could you give uh, for, for aspiring uh, entrepreneurs like yourself? I mean, you, you have succeeded in making your brand a global brand among the financial industry and so forth. Uh, uh, is there, is there uh, three pieces of advice that you would inspire? First of all, Everybody's an entrepreneur. Everybody has entrepreneurship in them. But my first lesson to people are: don't start your business out of school. Take a job for minimum five years, because a job will teach you, without a cost on your own, what a, how a business is run. That's the first advice I give to everybody. Yes, some people are lucky. I mean, not everybody's a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs that you can start something. I mean, history makes those people. But a normal human being does need the experience of a business running. How do you manage people? How do you manage finances? How do you run a business? So a five-year term in a job environment will give you that ability to understand how your boss manages the finances, how they pay the bills, how they manage the people, the big, how they hire the people, what, you know, how HR procedures they had. That's one. Second, once you go to a business, of course you do your homework. You do a business plan. But in my experience, none of the business plan worked. It doesn't matter how good a business plan is, things will happen which will be nowhere in your you know, thought process when you were doing the business plan or this will happen. Be ready for that. 
And this way you will be tested if you have the material to survive or not. If you are able to you know, improvise and have a response to that issue at the given time, you will survive. So that's critical. Be ready for contingency, be ready for something happens which you did not plan at all. It will happen. Uh, and, you know, uh, something goes wrong with the world, you know. In 2008, I give example, we were so excited and hyped up in Chinese market, uh, you know, that uh, we'll do very well. Certainly, full financial collapse in Europe. Everything went down in America. And we thought it will not affect us in China because Chinese market is not cheap. But what happened was we forgot that our customers were from Europe. And American companies, they, they were customers, and suddenly everything stopped. They stopped issuing orders, they, they just got into a panic mode, and there was a period of six months where we couldn't understand what happened. They need the software, they, need, they had done business, but they were spending money. So that is where you have to be ready. Have a contingency, be ready to take an action when something goes wrong with your brand. The third most part is you have to create a differentiator in your business. Today, when we're studying, a young man came to me and says, Mr. Gauri, I want to start a business and uh, I just want to know one thing you can tell me to do to succeed. I said, okay, doesn't matter what you sell, doesn't matter what you service. And there were hundreds of companies offering the same service and product like you. But there always somebody comes in out of the blue and to succeed against all those companies. How? That somebody creates a differentiator. Always create a differentiator between you and others. Now that differentiator could be anything at all. Everybody's wearing white shirt, wear a red shirt. So you can be stand out, you can stand out, people can look at you. And this is what I believe. So people don't understand or see the importance of standing out in a crowd or in a business. There's something weird. Sometimes I write articles which are totally, you know, challengeable and you know that creates such a good debate by the people. And I do it intentionally so people start debating the subject. Because you're doing, and people then talk about saying worry, and you know, even sometimes they're not happy with what I said, it creates a debate and creates the name again and again out. That's a differentiator. You do let people know you exist, otherwise, you'll be lost in the crowd. So, if people have the ability to be a great differentiator, they will be able to succeed because people will see them, they'll be seen from distance. Now, before we end, did, did you begin your company with a set of strategies? Uh, to, on how you, you spot your customers and then try to get the business. I do speak on this subject a lot in schools. In fact, uh, Net Souls case study is taught in one of the best schools in Pakistan, MBA. They're teaching our, our full case study, how we did it. And here I have a theory, and I still recall. When you start a new IT business especially, and especially in my case, I had a different experience. I had experience of software development, uh, network engineer, and I was a designer also systems. So when we uh, did start NetSuel, we said, okay, we'll go for business of three different areas, networking and software development and services. And whatever comes first, we'll take it. That was a strategy, very broad strategy. There was no focus at all. Just, you know, services area, we'll go and get the business. And that happened. We got our first customer, international customer, we serviced them, and we did well. Second, third, and gradually we started narrowing down the focus. Strategy kept maturing how we wanted to see it. So I do lecture, I said, I said, I tell my students, look, keep a, a bigger uh, focus when you start, uh, try things, and within those different areas, you may end up picking something up. In our case, the, the software we developed today was not planned and designed. It came out of that open strategy of taking any business and then literally deciding if you want to adopt it, and this is what we did. Uh, a customer came to us to help get, get help in developing a laser finance small module. So, all right, that's interesting. So, we did that. Then we realized uh, the customer will need more of it. So, we offered the customer, look, don't pay for it, let me develop. And then, when it's done, you pay for it then. So, we can own the rent. And the customer was very happy. Somebody's taking, willing to take the risk and he doesn't have to pay. And that worked. So, we developed another module, we paid for it, and the customer looked at it. Oh, yes. So, they paid, cut the check. And we got our first product ready from that first customer. And this is what, so over the period, gradually what we did brought the focus narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. Today, our study is very simple. Become a global provider of lease and finance solution around the world. Go to the world. And then not just lease and finance, go hire, go lending. In lending, you have credit cards, you have loans, you have loans with up asset. So we are going to go. So strategies are evolve. You can make your strategy. I said you can make business plans. Most of them will not work. But if you have a broader, uh, you know, offering a broader portfolio to offer to customers, one of them will become your expertise over the next 10 years. 
And that's what happens. Don't go with one strategy or one focus and say, okay, I'll do that. That may not work. But more offering. And then, of course, be smart. Opportunity knocks. Look at that opportunity which knocks. Maybe some people could be, oh, I never had opportunity. But they had. They never looked at it. They missed it. So that's the difference. If you can look at opportunity into the eye and say, oh, my God, that's my opportunity. Let's grab it. And this is what happened to that show at that time. We were able to see the niche area of the finance and we picked it up. And last 16 years, we have really missed it. Happening. Is there one quote uh, that you live by all proverb, which your father has passed on to you that kept you going as an entrepreneur today? Well, my father is the quote. <laughs> He's uh, 86 years old. Plays golf. 86. 86. Plays golf every morning at 5.36 six o'clock in the early bed. But obviously, now he can play even nine hole, he plays only three, four. But that's what is the quote about me. He is a tremendous person who he showed, I mean, when I was growing young, he was an entrepreneur himself uh, from a very humble background. And he came to a big city of Lahore with his family and started doing things, selling oil, selling small things, and started building his family. Seven brothers, he sent all the brothers to high, the best schools in the world by just, you know, and not very rich man by any standard, but he did that. So he was the one who would say, never, never give up, because I saw him not giving up. Oh, there were times he was in crisis with his business, but he was always be good to the children, always be smiling. He will not talk about business at home at all. He will just go to his office and focus. But at home, he was a lovely father because he will focus on his family. I think that is the key, that there will be times when things will be bad. But then that's where you will be tested as a person, how strong and mature person you are to really take the challenge. Some people will struggle, they will just fall, they will not get up. Other will just do that, get up and start again. And that is from a father. Uh, God bless him. Amazing uh, endurance in him to survive and fight out. Today he enjoys his golf and uh, his life. <laughs> now, if Net soul technologies were to fail back then, uh, 15, 16 years ago. Would, would you choose, uh, uh, you know, opening up a, a new company, or would you rather, you know, choose be an employee if Net soul had failed? Definitely, I think it's a important question, the right question. I believe at that time, uh, the failure could have been second year, third year, could have been. Uh, yes, at that time, if we fail and the company ceased to exist, uh, would have gone back as a consultant and start offering uh, my services to people with uh, you know solution needs. I was good at that. Uh, I had the ability to solve difficult issues at that time. I would have gone. Uh, that's the truth. Uh, but I never thought about failure. I think that's key. Don't think about failure. Ex expect failures, but don't think about them every day or every minute. Just keep going, uh, you know, to work. Get to office every day. You know, I tell the story to everybody. In early days, I opened the office, went to the office, and you know, start telling everybody, "Look, I'm offering services," and nobody will call. I had four employees, and every day, I'll sit in the office and you know, make calls to people, but you know, and expecting somebody to call back. Hey, Salim, we need your services. Nobody will call. And after three months, you know, whole day in the office or going to the customer, somebody to meet, I called my wife one day. I said to her, uh, let's read her name, can you please uh, call my office three, four times a day so the bell rings, so I feel somebody's calling, a customer's calling. And a good soul she is, she will call me at 11 o'clock, bell ring, and I'll get excited, oh, maybe somebody's calling for the business. And of course she was there. But that's how you feel in early days when business doesn't come in. But you do survive, and we survived. And one day that call came in from a customer who wanted a service, and this is it. The rest is history. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Sully, for sharing with us uh, your passion uh, in technology. And thank you for joining us here at the National Quiz to say hi in conversation with Mr. Salim uh, Guari, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman for Netso Technologies in Pakistan. I'm Robin Steinberg. Have a good week ahead.